Hi everybody, uh, everybody who's watching uh, live, uh, a live podcast, something that I um, wanna be doing a little bit more. Uh, my good friend here, who I'm gonna let introduce himself to the Vayner Nation in a second, and I were trying to get together in person. Unfortunately, I got caught up with some travel, and so we're doing this remote, even though we're both, I think, in the same city of New York right now, but I'll be heading out shortly. Uh, but, um, you know, as I, as I started, getting into the NFT scene more outwardly in 2021, when I was kind of doing my homework in the late parts of, um, of 20 and really Q1 of 2021, one of my favorite artists, aesthetically, subjectively, and I think art is definitely the eye of the beholder, but for me, um, I just really enjoyed the, this work from this artist and then when we got connected and I saw the sweetness and and just genuineness of his humanity. Um, I knew that we would interact for a long, long time and we've both been very, very, very busy since uh, our first kind of interactions earlier this year, but I'm excited to introduce someone to all of you who are listening right now and we're, uh, we're gonna chop it up and I know he's got some stuff brewing so I wanna give a little exposure to that and then really just try to inspire uh, and educate people on what's going on in this space because I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of you out there that have the potential for a version of this story and that's why it's important to me. So, Piyoshisa, how are you, my friend? Oh, I'm doing great. This is really surreal. I'm gonna be honest, Gary, I grew up watching your videos <laughs> and being a major fan. And to go from seeing you on Twitter interact with the space to having a first call with you to being here, this is beautiful and I'm so darn happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Why don't you tell everybody who you are, your name, where you're from, and why don't you take the floor for three, four minutes and tell everybody your artistic and NFT journey. Okay, cool. So I'm Victor. My artist name is Fawocious. I make NFTs. I do art, animate the art. It's super abstract, poppy, colorful, primary color, surreal art. And I started with a little website in my family home. I had my phone. I would take pictures of my art, make prints of it. I bought a printer, would cut the cut the art and sell it for like 20 bucks, five bucks, do commissions for 10 bucks and do that every day until one day someone bought a painting that I did for $90 and I was losing my mind, never sold art for that much. Oh my God, $90. And he sends me an email saying, oh my God, your work is amazing. I love the painting I have, I'd like more. However, I'm not interested in physical ownership. I want digital ownership. And he sent me a link to Super Rare, a link to Nifty Gateway, all the NFT platforms, and told me to apply. And so I did. And ever since what, then. When was that, Victor? That was last year in March. So March of 2020, you become aware more of digital art and immediately NFTs at the same time, or a little bit digital art, and then slowly but surely, this concept of NFTs. Um. I was doing digital art before just on my iPad, but I wasn't, there was, I didn't know about the concept of NFTs. It was just, oh, the only way you can own it is if you make a print of it or something. Correct. And, and how quickly did you, did you go down the rabbit hole of NFTs when this person reached out to you and said, I want to do digital, like that blow your mind. You're like, wait a minute, that's so easy. That's easier. I don't have to cut. I don't have to ship. Like, did it resonate immediately? Well, immediately I thought it was a scam. <laughs> I, thought, I thought, because I'm a little kid, I didn't have family I could really ask for help. So I thought, is he trying to steal the IP? Is he gonna buy like my characters and go make a TV show or sell shirts? I don't I know. See. I see. So I was hesitant at first, but you go on Twitter and immediately- Hold on one second, my friend. Back to scams and bad situations. Okay. Uh, in the Facebook group. Oh, what's that, Dust? Oh, Dust, all right. Did you want? Dust, were you talking about the Facebook comment? The, the fake posting of me? Yeah. 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 It's just it's so terrible. terrible. Yeah. There's somebody fake in Facebook saying that I, I will never give free anything. Like, I will never ask you for your Ethereum. Like, you know, uh, it's just, it's unbelievable. Anyway, spam everywhere. I'm live right now. Podcast listeners, sorry to interrupt the show. There's some, you know, fake accounts trying to scam people. Never give your seed phrase. And now your secret phrase to your MetaMask. Anyway, nonetheless, so at first, that was very funny timing. At first, you were concerned about that. Then what happens? 
uh, after I thought it was a scam? Yeah, like did you do some more homework? Did you join some Discord? Did you go on Twitter? What got you over the hump? It was Googling what's an NFT and Super Rare had a newsletter where they explained everything, broke it down, did the Mona Lisa original painting mm -hmm. analogy. And that really made it click. And then going on Super Rare and scrolling and seeing all the artists sell the work and see how much I was like, whoa, these are real people. And that's when I was like, okay, this is something, but the world doesn't know about it yet. Did, um, when, when, okay, so $90 physical blows your mind. Mm -hmm. What becomes the next blow my mind moment? What's the first NFT you sold for at what number that really got you going like, whoa? I mean, the first NFT I ever sold was for $1,500. To that person? Uh, to someone else, actually. Interesting. Yeah. So you so tell me that story in detail because again, it was just what I, you know, Victor, what I want is A, everybody in the Vayner Nation to know who you are because I think you're worth knowing. B, for this podcast to spur three more Fawoshuses, mm. right? Because we are living in an incredible moment for artists where this 20 year run of do stuff on the internet for exposure and then other things can happen is starting to shift before our eyes and people are actually able to sell things in digital form and it's very special. And so I want people to hear in detail, which is why I agreed to do this podcast. Um, so you, you, is this the first thing you made an NFT form? Cause you so, said the first thing you sold. Go ahead. So when I first joined this platform, I was minting art for weeks. I received advice to mint every week. Okay. Because every day is too much. So wait, do once a week. So I did that and no one was bidding. I'd get like $20 bids, but these were yeah. these were not so this these were offers only coming in it wasn't an auction it wasn't a buy it now it, you'd put it up and you would get quote unquote offers yeah so on super rare there's an option to list or there's an option just to hold until you want to accept now there's a timer where you can make it a structured auction mm -hmm. but when i joined it's just you accept when you want <laughs> or, or before they withdraw their bid yep so I waited weeks minting once a week and getting bids, but nothing substantial. And then one day someone working at Super Rare said, I think you should list. It would make a good first sale and it's a larger amount. So I don't know <laughs> if you, there's no harm really in listing it. So I listed my first piece for 4.5 Ethereum, which at the time was $1,500. And did what gave you at this point, you were aware that some art was going for real money. So you were like, cause right, cause you just, don't forget, when was this by the way? I want the um, timeline. Right now we're June, 2020. Right, so you know, only us, only 10 weeks earlier, you're freaking out at $90 on paper, yes. but through this education, discovering this world, you're saying, fuck it, I want a thousand for digital. You thought there was a chance, let's see what happens. Yeah, I received guidance saying that these $100 bids will look like a lot, but I learned about crypto. I didn't know about crypto. And I learned about what whales are. And I was like, oh, okay, I can list it for a little bit higher. And that's just what this market is. It's not college kids. It's these people who know how to trade crypto and know all that world. So it's something different. So I felt fine doing that, but I didn't think it would happen. I was like, okay, give me this advice. Let's see. And the next day after I listed it, it sold for 1,500. And I went on Twitter and I was like, oh my God, I'm so excited. And I did this whole Twitter, spammed Twitter, just <laughs> saying my <laughs> thankfulness. Yeah. yeah, and I took screenshots, not in a annoying way, just in a, I can't believe this happened. And I guess the community saw that, oh, this kid just, what? Just sold the piece, who is this kid? I've never even seen the art. And then other collectors saw my excitement and me yelling and went on my super rare. And because I've been minting for weeks, I had all this work that I haven't sold. So in the same day, I sold the one piece for 1,500 and then two other pieces for like $2,000. Crazy. <laughs> How did you go to sleep that night? Oh, I don't think I did, honestly. I think I just drew and then went to school the next day and was like, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs>
Right, because what, you're a junior or senior in high school at this point? I was a senior in high school and it was like a did week before anybody? COVID lockdown. Unbelievable. And did you like tell anybody? Do you have like a best friend that you're like, yo, you'll never believe this shit. I made $5,000 <laughs> last night. Or were you almost weirded out by it? Like how did, how did it go down? This one girl in my class tapped my shoulder and said, what are NFTs? And I was like, non-fungible tokens. And she said, never mind. <laughs> And that was the extent to my discussion about it. <laughs> what happens next? What happens next in- In your life, what happens, where does the story go from there? What, when is, what ends up happening after that? Um, after that, I minted again. I waited two weeks, I think, to mint. And then after that, I did a physical painting and then I took a picture of it and animated the picture and I minted that picture and whoever bought that NFT also got the physical painting. And it catched this collector's eye. And he said, whoa, I've never seen that before. I want that, but I also want two more NFTs. So again, I sold three NFTs in like a day. <laughs> and everyone saw that and was like, whoa, who is this kid selling all this art right now? And it built more hype, I guess. And then what happened? And then what happened? How much did that go for, the piece and the three? I think it was, at the time, $12,000, $15,000. So, I mean, this is like, your fucking life is out of control at this point, right? Oh, definitely. It's the most money I've ever seen in my life, and my goal was to move out. I was in a really toxic, abusive home where I'd get yelled at every day. My family hated my art, said I could never do anything with it. And to make that much money and see that I could move out and leave this abusive household changed my life. I felt so free. I felt so happy. And, you know, it's a realization that, oh, my God, my dreams are coming true right now. Did you take the Ethereum and convert it to U.S. dollars? You must have because you needed it, right? Well, I wasn't 18 and my family wouldn't help me. So all of it was stuck in Ethereum because I had, there's no, I tried every platform, everything. Holy but I, shit, right. So it was all stuck in Ethereum, and you didn't which want helped them, and, me. And you didn't want them to know, right? Yeah, no way, no one could know. Right, so you're, fuck. So fucking, this goes down, like your life, to your point, your, it, it just happened. Your life dreams came true through NFT and Twitter really, which created some buzz, right? COVID hits. So now you're in this abusive home that you are you hate and now you're probably stuck there more parts of the day, school and whatever probably used to be an escapism. You're mm -hmm. sitting on all this ETH, but you can't get it. And when did you turn 18? I turned 18 January 1st. Like of the, of, of, so you had to, so you're, you're sitting for like, you're like, fuck, I have to wait eight months. You have no idea how Ethereum is gonna go up or down. You're not sure about that. That's all new shit to you. And you're just literally going through COVID, life changing, and you're counting down to January. Yes, exactly. Wow. <laughs> That's insane, bro. Yeah. It's all very surreal. It's so funny, Lee just said in the comment, I was, and Dustin picked up on, I was literally gonna say the same thing. It's like a fucking movie. <laughs> it's literally like a fucking movie. So what happens, you you keep the momentum going through the summer and fall and winter? Yeah, I just keep doing what I'm doing. Nifty Gateway in like November, there was the Picasso's Bull sold for $55,000 and that was the record sale. Everyone was like, oh my God, $55,000. And I saw that and I said, whoa, that's a lot of money. Whoa, what is Nifty? And that's when they kind of excelled as a new platform that everyone was talking about. And I, tech, you can't do this now, but I just DM them. I said, hey, can I be on, <laughs> please? And they said, sure. So I had my first Nifty Gateway drop and um, that was just accessing a whole other part of this that? community. That was, I think, also November last year, October last year. So I'm it's bad October, at November. That's right, October, <laughs> November. And how does that go down? It went amazing. Uh, everything sold out. I got to sell to more uh, people. Yeah, more people and just grew my collector base. It was amazing. How, how financially well did that project do? I don't remember how much I made. Oh, actually I do. I sold, <laughs> I sold my first one of one for $25,000. Just one one of one for 25K. And I was like, whoa, 
I've this is the most I've made for one thing. I'm used to like bundle sales or like little additions, but one piece for twenty five thousand dollars. I couldn't believe it. And I think other people saw that too and were like, Oh, this is really something. This isn't just some kid like running around being crazy. It's something. It's fantastic. That so what's happening? You're going through the holidays. When do you notice that, what, what were the moments that made you say NFT? Because you knew this was this underground thing. Did you think it might just go away quickly, that it was a very quick little burst, a little fat, quick fad? Did you like, were you, how are you feeling about it? Let's say, now wait, September comes. Are you just now done with school and you're not going to college, you're just gonna do this thing? And like, how did, how did September come at you? Because you said you were a senior, Back in March, that means you graduated. Oh wait, I went from junior to senior, sorry. Got it, I'm sorry, got it. So you're still, I mean, are you still, did you just finish high school? Uh, high school ended like two months ago. So you, you graduated high school two months ago? Yeah. Amazing, so you got it. So you, September you go back to whatever. So when does it start feeling like NFTs are going more broad for you? When did that first hit the scene? January, February of this year? Um, honestly, I do think it was when Picasso's bull sold f for $55,000 because just seeing other media discuss it, seeing royalties, seeing other people, I had a lot of mentors in this space that are older that were in NFTs before these platforms existed, hearing them like preach to me their ideas. I don't know. I always knew it was something, but when that sold for, for $55,000, I said, okay. I'm, I'm in this, I'm in it, and. By the way, uh, uh, for everybody who's in live chat right now, uh, please let's, I see a lot of you know who Ferocious is, and a lot of people are curious. For the people that know, please share some links in your chats on Twitch, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, of his work, because people are jonesing, and we're not gonna, uh, there you go, Dustin jumping on board. Um, so, so, when does it go to the next level? So now you've hit this crazy level, you know, call it $100,000, $200,000, levels that you could have never imagined. And then, and then Ethereum starts going up. You're yes. still sitting on that Ethereum, so your money's compounding. When does the next level hit for you and the space? The next level for me was my birthday, January 1st this year. Um, I had another, it was my second Nifty Gateway drop. And the total was 340k and it sold everything sold out in like five seconds and we like <laughs> broke the website and i was like oh my god i made this in like five seconds what just happened everyone in the community was so loving and it was stunning to me did you, because did you feel that you were adopted by the whales and collectors of the nft movement i feel like i was adopted by the whole space absolutely because at a time where I was in such a bad home where I had no one I could go to for help, I could go to older artists, I could go to collectors and ask them for advice on anything about like doing my laundry to what is Ethereum, how long should I hold, do I sell, what, what is Bitcoin, <laughs> like Bitcoin. all these different things. How do, you, how do you explain what an NFT is in your day to day if a cousin or a friend of a friend or just somebody on the street, like how do you explain it? Not when you're in Miami and the whole like taking photos and everybody knows. I mean like, you know, I don't know you well enough and obviously if you had toxic home, you know, your circle's probably small, but you know, when you describe, or if this was national television and you gotta explain it, how do you go about it? Um, I explained it one time to my friend just saying, it's not the most accurate way, but I just no, say, no. I, the, by the way, there, there is no accurate way. This is why I'm asking you. It's your way, which is what I'm just curious about. I just say like you see a one of one painting in the same way people love that one of one painting and want to keep it safe and special. And they're so proud to say that it's the real one. Um, and there's fakes out there, but there's authenticators to see that there's the real one of one painting. I just say that I make NFTs, which are the digital, digital version of that. Do you, um? okay, so then your birthday, 304, now you're like fucking super rich in your mind, right? <laughs> like, and so how do you handle all that? And then, and then next, for you or for the space, obviously I think we're getting to the point where Beeple's craziness yes. starts kicking in. But, um, you know, 
and then characters like me and Cuban are showing up on TV. Like, take us to Q1 of this year. You had the birthday thing. What happens next? So next, I had my, I did a drop with a musician named Two Feet. And he did music and I did art. And now you see a lot of musicians in the space. But at the time, it's like, whoa, a platinum recording artist is in the space and cares and wants to learn about it. What? And we did that drop and made a million, like $1.1 million. And we were the third drop on Nifty ever to make a million ever. And everyone was like, whoa, someone else crossed over the million dollar threshold. What's going on? And more people were talking about NFTs. There was articles written about it because he's a musician. And that was the next whoa moment. And then? And then I had, as you know, my artifact shoe drop. Yep. So I worked with the artifact guys. I was talking to them way back when, but finally we sat down, got shoe designs, talked about life, talked about philosophy, and I drew these drawings for the shoes. We set it up for Nifty, put it out, and it made three million dollars in seven minutes and that was crazy that was i lost my mind i've never done a real article before where someone like knew about me and was asking me questions and it was crazy to google for and see like artifact shoe artifact shoe see it on the news see people talking about my shoes saying what is this <laughs> um, what, what are you passionate about so what about now like where's your mindset what do you think about the space? What do you think about yourself? What are you trying to accomplish? Give us a little of the, you know, of the moment now. Right now, I see the space as still new. I see the space as something that has so much potential in every aspect. I mean, owning digital assets is the future. The future is digital. And I Victor, think- Victor, do you think it's, you know, it's funny, the way you're talking is so matter of fact Whereas everyone else is trying to convince, I feel like you live in it. And I guess my question is, given that you're so young, do you feel like in a world where you watch your classmates never hesitate to spend money on digital assets like power ups in Madden or 2K or Fortnite or Roblox, do you feel like you have that advantage, let's say over the cliche 40 year old who, you know, your whole, your whole ecosystem of your contemporaries, whether they were your friends or not, you knew what was going on in your world. Do you feel like because the under 18 crowd has so often paid for things that were just digital and coming to school flexing that you had a Fortnite skin that cost money or a, a Madden card, do you feel like just because it's always been there, it almost feels like NFTs are completely normal and that for people of a different generation, they don't have that advantage. Similar to like, for a lot of people that are 30 and 40, having a cell phone feels very normal, but for their 60 year old parent, it didn't. Do you think it's a generational thing to why you're so matter of fact of it? Like how, why it's just so uncomfortably obvious? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when I was born, there was like a PlayStation 2 in the house. Like <laughs> I was so used to playing video games all the time. So I didn't understand Ethereum when I got in, but it's like, oh, Digital, okay, I play video games. I know video game money. I know I know this. So it was really easy for me to accept and to just take it for what it is and keep going. Um, yeah, I think so completely. Do you understand why people struggle with it? Oh, definitely, yeah. And, and I think that's why it's important. Like for my Christie's drop, there are physical paintings. And I know some people are mad about physicals. They say, oh, NFTs and physicals shouldn't exist together. I think they'll both coexist. People will always like physicals, I think. I, this, yeah, I mean, I'm so fascinated by people's need for ore in a mm -hmm. world where the world lives on ant. Mm -hmm. It's really quite sad, actually. People live in a need to convince or have it their way and, and just have this great belief in ore. This is dead, or this, my way, not that way. And the reality is, it's always gonna be both. It's just like this interview right now, right? We've all normalized video conferencing and that's awesome and that comes in handy. For example, I would usually do all my podcast guests in real, per real life, right? And we had a, I had a scheduling issue and what we wanted to do Thursday I couldn't make and then I leave tonight and like we just wouldn't have done this. 
but, this mm-hmm. is it. but we're giving the exact content that's needed, but we still are thrilled to do this in person in six months if we have something else to talk about. Yeah, It's both, I couldn't agree with you more. People ask me about sports cards. Oh, Gary, you're so into NFTs. I'm like, I've, I'm, I'm about to buy an ungodly amount of sports cards <laughs> in Chicago in a month at the National. It's always gonna be both. It is both now in our society. We flirt in the digital, we flirt in real life. We mm. order food at a restaurant, we order food in the digital. We watch a sporting event in real life, we watch it. I mean, it's, it's always gonna be both. I agree. What, uh, why don't you tell everybody about the Christie's things? Cause that must, I mean, you probably a year ago thought when you're 90, you might have something at Christie's and now you're here. Oh yeah, <laughs> I thought I thought living off art, I'd have to wait till forty and then maybe die and then <laughs> get in Christie's or something. So to be the youngest artist at Christie's is insane, especially for the content matter. For this story is me coming out as transgender. This story is me talking about my piece of family in the most raw way. Like I was worried I would send the art to Christie's and they'd be like, you know what? This is too sad or something. But no, they let me say my story. They let me have this platform and talk to the world. And I think it's important too that there are the physical paintings because it has catched attention for traditional collector eyes. Maybe they don't know about NFTs, but they're like, oh, a painting. Oh, there's, you have to get the NFT. What? I don't really know what it means, but I'm, I'm gonna learn more because I like the art so much. And that makes me excited. Dust, if you could put the art back up. Victor, if you could speak to the art a little bit, because I think people will enjoy that. Now, obviously, this is a podcast that a lot of people are listening to, so we'll talk it through, but obviously the ones who joined us on the live stream as I decided to do this as a live one, uh, you're getting a little more of the visuals. What uh, what are we looking at, or what inspired it? Or, you know, obviously I see year one, age 14, it hurts to hide. Is that, is 14 when you kind of knew you had different feelings? Yeah, 14 is when I really started to question who I was and realize, because I grew up in such a bad home, I didn't realize it was bad until I got older and was on the internet and reading people say that these things were bad that I thought were normal. What it, and, give, us, give us an example, if you don't mind, to share anything you're willing to share. I mean, just like getting yelled at all the time for everything, getting hit. I'm like, oh, if you're loved, everyone gets hit. And then I realized, oh, that's bad. <laughs> Not everyone does get punched in the face or something. So it's just stuff like that um, where I really started to realize that I didn't like it there. Uh, 14, because all these NFTs come with archival doodles that I actually drew at those ages. So 14 years old is also when I started to actually pour my feelings into art and know that it's all I had in life at that time. Mm. Um, Maybe another piece that we could speak to? So that's 14. What about, what about 16? What, just, uh, what about 16 uh, when a child feels lost? So 16 uh, is when all of that pain of realizing that life was hard, uh, my family was mean to me, being scared because they said art, you couldn't pursue art. 16 is when it caved down on me and I became very suicidal. I was in therapy and my family said depression is not real. After my therapist said that I might have depression, they pulled me out of therapy. I had no help, no teachers would help me, no one would help me. And this piece is me being a kid and not knowing what life is and not really wanting to be alive because I I wanted a hug or something. What about friend groups? Did you have a friend network? Uh, No, growing up I didn't really have friends. I was really awkward. So your social awkwardness kind of like you didn't play the part of popular kid and you weren't able to find others that maybe were you were just within your own self, huh? Well, because my family was so abusive, I had to go to court and then move schools. So I moved schools and I lost the friends I did have and I was just by myself every day. Everyone already formed those friendships they had. So I would just sit in a corner and draw every day. When did you know that you were good at art? Um, it got to a point of me drawing every day where kids were like, what are you doing? <laughs> and they would walk by me and grab my sketchbook and they would flip through it. I was losing my mind. I'm like, oh my God, don't, don't look, don't look. But they'd be like, wait, this is good. I like this. Right. And they even, would be even, sweet. 
Got it. So even people that maybe weren't necessarily your friends were taking note and that obviously carried a ton of weight. Yes, definitely. What next for you and this space? Um, I think because of the position I'm in, uh, I have means now to get like help. Like if I want to do something gnarly, if I want to build a robot, it's something I think about a lot. <laughs> or if I want to build something gnarly or create a new metaverse kind of thing or whatever, I have time right now where I can sit and think about what I want to do. I can have a team to help me. I can, I don't know, this space is so early and I think sometimes people are rushing to do stuff where I see it more as this is going to grow and this is going to be insane and I want to put my heart into something that I can really say is what I want to say. Um, so right now I'm not sure. I just put my heart into the Christie's project. <laughs> so I'm trying to take a step back and really analyze what my life is right now and what certain things mean to me. What, um, what do you tell the, the 14, 15, and more importantly, I would argue maybe even harder for the 49 year old who's now long given up on their hope of being an artist. In, instead of just a cliche, you can do it, put out like, like, is there any nuance, any kind of like second tier for motivation, whether it's practical, um, uh, you know, questions or um, any kind of like unique insight that you might be able to share and then I'm gonna grab the uh, five individuals that we have quick questions from my VFriends Discord to jump in here and ask, do a little Q&A with you. But do you know anything, anything stand out to you? Because I think the two groups that I'm most passionate about are the 15 year olds who absolutely watch a lot of my content and clearly gonna be very inspired by your story. But honestly, I believe that NFTs have the potential to do things for the 42, 47, 62 year old that are remarkable. And look, you in NFT art land are gonna live one of those 1% lives, a Mr. Mm -hmm. Beast, a Logan Paul, a Charlie D'Amelio, you're gonna, but like much like influencer marketing, I think that there's a lot of people literally watching right now. And there's not that many people watching, literally people listening right now. And there's not that many people listening when you compare it to 7 billion people on earth and I think literally somebody who's watching right now or listening right now, even if this is two years from this recording, is a person that could actually make $200,000 a year selling NFTs who'd given up on their creativity and decided to become a professional doing something they don't love at all. Any, any insights, anything you can give to those people? I think in the NFT space, there's a lot of like anonymity and people like, that don't really want to share a lot or like sometimes artists are so in their zone working that they don't realize what they're doing is really cool so in the nft space i think it's cool to share what you're doing like take a picture of your workspace and be like this is what i'm doing it doesn't even have to be done document other, yeah document because collectors or other artists don't have concept they're not you so I think to provide perspective to other people really helps them learn more about you and by proxy like learn more about you and the art and want to pay more attention to what you're doing because they can see more than just like the one picture on their screen. And I think that's important. Do you, do you think Andy Warhol really figured that out many generations ago? Oh, absolutely. Andy Warhol was great at that. Um, let's get into the Q&A, Dustin. Let's bring some people in. Chris, how are you? What's up, Gary? What's up, Ferocious? Hi. Fire away, my friend. All right, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, um, so uh, <clears throat> it's great to meet you, first of all. Like, I, I love your work. Uh, both of you guys in the NFT and the entrepreneurial world love it. Uh, I've been following you for a long time, Gary. You're, you're kind of like a, a long-distance mentor that you don't even know you are. And, you. Uh, and, and, and Fios is the story, man. Like, it's, it's a great story. Like, I, I, props, kudos to you, man. I, I wish the best for you in, in this journey you got going. But I guess I, I actually have a question that you both could answer for being on, on the uh, NFT side. Uh, where do you see the market at in, let's say, the next five years with the NFTs? Like, since we have the regulators and everything coming into the crypto world, like, where do you see the market now, like, in the next five years from 
the uh, the artist standpoint side and the the market trading side. Where do you, where do you think? And you can both answer that. Why don't you go, Victor, and I'll jump in after you. Um, I think there'll be a lot more artists in the space, and I think it'll come down to just like sh showing who you are more, talking more. I mean, YouTube is full of all these creators, and then there are these niches of people who do different things. So I think people will find their way of community in the five years. Um, I don't know. You know, for me, I think the first thing Victor said is exactly right. I think Victor, I think the friends, I think others, people, and many others do have a first mover advantage here. I do think supply will outpace demand. And I think that's why I talk about 98 percent of NFT projects maybe not being great long-term investments. Be now, it's because 2% is still gonna be hundreds of artists, thousands of artists, and, and hundreds and thousands of kind of, let's say, collectibles, maybe the way I think about it, right? Um, mm -hmm. but, but I do think that people have to be very careful. Like, like to me, what I'd like to think me and Victor represent, if I'm betting, because I'm definitely betting on myself, and this is one of the kids that I, and I've been watching, that I think has a real oh, awesome. shot of pulling it off. I think, I think Victor and V Friends' biggest vulnerability is what Amazon's biggest vulnerability was in 2000. Amazon was destined to become the greatest company in the world. Mm -hmm. Amazon's stock was worthless in 2000. Do I believe that there's a significant chance that V Friends and Fuocious's art could be less valuable than it is on the open market today? I do because I think things play out long and I think there can mm -hmm. be a dip when, let's say when there's just so much and it's that moment in time. I mean, look at the look at look at uh, Ethereum's price. The day V Friends launched, it was forty three hundred. It's seventeen hundred right now. I mean, things are volatile. Right. It's early, mm -hmm. so you know I'm always cautious to who's listening. Do I think NFT is a big deal? I think it's the biggest deal since social media. I think it's here forever. I agree. Do I do I think that ninety eight percent is dangerous investing? I do. Do I think you can be great at day trading if you spend all your time on it? Bored Ape, you know, uh, excuse me, excuse me, be friends. The numbers are staggering with the way people are, are flipping them right now. Um, you know, art blocks, wicked craniums, you know, so rare. Even my fucking pickle, if you bought it for nothing, like, you know, like, <laughs> is there day trading right now? Absolutely. Mm. There was day trading in 2000 with internet stocks. But I think you have to be incredible, incredible at um, being thoughtful about A, knowing that this is very high risk, so you should be investing money you can afford to lose, mm. and B, playing it in a 10-year window instead of a 10-week window. Mm. Like, probably the far majority of Fawocious's art that I will buy in my life will happen on the next big carnage NFT moment where everything gets dragged down. Mm. Because I think all of it, if he does what I think he does, and he stays this passionate and creative, and kids talking about fucking building robots, if, if he d does what he is capable of, in 22 years it works out. And I think too many people are thinking about day by day. Yeah. People are, people are like day by day. It's fucking crazy to me. Well, like if you, if you, let's say you're trying to do like a five year plan and, and you, wanna, you want to, uh, incorporate you should bet, Chris, you should bet. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'll let you finish. Okay, and, and you want to uh, 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 incorporate the crypto NFT space? Um, how 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 do you bet on that? I mean, every, do you see ready? Very easily. Mm -hmm. You put every dollar into it that you can afford to go to zero. I got you. And and, and like what I'm talking about is like real. It's too world. high risk. Otherwise, you have to understand it truly is. It's too early. Mm -hmm. So you can only put money that can go to zero. Okay, I got because you. if you if you need it and it goes down by 90% and you needed it when you put it in and you thought it was gonna go up and it goes down by 90 and you need it. Mortgage, uh -huh. food, life, you're gonna get fucked. Well, if well, it's, well, go ahead. well, what I'm looking at is like real world, like like incorporated into like a real world business. Like, um, um, I don't really wanna say too much on here, but like, um, do it. well, do you, it. I mean, like, like, okay. I, that, I, that's different. That's called execution on your end. That you I, should do regardless. I got you. Well, I, well, You're I'm looking at two people that were at different times, you know, Victor, a year before, you know, nine months before me discovered it and fucking uh -huh. did something about it. There you go. And, and that's kind of where and I'm he at. started. And by the way, we were on two very different spectrums. Mm -hmm. He was a child. 
mm. and had time. I was in the prime of my career with Vayner Media exploding, and both of us stopped what we were doing from different angles. So, like, the only way to like the question of yours is fucking action. Mm-hmm. I get that. I get what you're saying. All right, we got we got to get to a bunch of questions before we wrap. Talk Appreciate to you it, soon. guys. Good, well. good to meet you. Thank you. Uh huh. Oh my God, Eugene, how are you? Oh Hello. My God. Hi, I'm so nervous. This is unbelievable. <laughs> Good to see you, Eugene. Hi, Gary. You're you're uh, you're a bit of a hero. I started Thank posting you. stuff online because of you, and I've been a little successful on TikTok because of you, Feocious Victor. I like a couple of your paintings uh, really speak out to me. It hurts to hide. Really speaks out to me, and um, now I can fly. So the the first one, and the last one really really spoke out to me and like congratulations on all your success you are a pretty awesome <laughs> oh eugene you're awesome thank no, you awesome. no you <laughs> i love it eugene you have a question brother yeah i'm so nervous uh so i'm a chef and i lost my job during the pandemic and i pivoted to digital i teach cooking uh like kitchen trip tricks and like hacks and stuff so my question is um like I'm really good at the jab. I love giving stuff away. So I give away all my tricks. If anybody DMs me with any specific question about food and cooking, about specific brands of like culinary yeah. stuff, I give them an honest answer. And my question is like, how how do you not feel guilty when you do the right hook? And in, by, by, in, be by believing in what you're selling. Okay. Um, I mean, like, sort of the right hook in terms of maybe asking for help. I'm really bad at selling. To be honest, I'm, like, a really bad salesman. I get it. I get it. Some people are, which is okay. Yeah. Um, so, you could bring somebody in and share in sales. Okay. You know, I'm, you know, I hate asking. Believe it or not, I hate asking, too. I just had a conversation with my brother last week. I'm like, you know, I hate raising capital, but it's a real thing. And, you know, maybe, maybe you can play a role in my world, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I think asking, uh, I think it blows people's mind when they hear that I'm, I don't love it either. I really don't. I like when it comes to me, which is why I like retail. This is $9 and you just put it on a shelf and it's almost like not asking. Yeah. But um, I think when someone is a terrible salesperson, they should have someone do it for them and give that person a commission. Okay. Right, like, little, look. Start with your family, then look at your friend group, mm -hmm. and see if somebody wants to take twenty percent of your action by representing the sales engine. That's a good idea. That's why I'm Gary B. <laughs> <laughs> That's you great. Know, this is my, you know, that joke because that was fucking ridiculous. Is about <laughs> is about you know, this is my domain. This is business. That part I'm comfortable with, and that I know that's right. That's great. Yeah, because um, I'm about to have a baby in September, and this whole year uh, I've just been posting stuff without any regard of trying to make any money, but like in the hopes that like later on I could generate some revenue. Mm -hmm. And now I'm getting, to be honest, I'm actually a little scared because a baby is coming, and I'm gonna have to support you know my family financially, but I don't want to stop giving the stuff away free, like creating the content for free. Brother, I'm give, I'm, I do it every fucking day. Don't be scared. If, you're, if I'm a hero of yours, good news. You're looking at the fucking poster child. I give away 98% of the time. And then, you know, once a year, a book or a sneaker, or once every two years or 18 months, like, you know, good news. You've built, you've built up a lot of equity. And you're going to, you know, I've got another thing to tell you. There's another side to the selling when you give a lot. I give a lot and it is stunning to me how many people don't support me. It's one thing on VFriends, which was expensive. There's people who I, you know, consume my content at scale, I DM with, and they don't buy three books when a book comes out for 15 bucks a piece. So what ends up happening is you realize it's okay for me to ask and it's okay for them, even though I've given them a ton of value, for them to say no. I get mad at my friends who are like, Fucking, I hate your style. Like I did it for a year. I asked all these fuckers, nobody bought. They're fucking taking me for did it. I'm like, no, no, the market is the market. You, and, and stop fucking, you know, like maybe that person doesn't have $45 right now. Maybe they're faking it on Instagram 
and they don't even have $45 to their name. So it's ask without expectation, give without expectation, and be okay if they do or don't buy. Okay, okay. Just on that note, I actually did buy two of your be friends, so. <laughs> well, so that means we're both doing well. I'm really happy about it. I hope to see you at VCon. Me too. Right, Stay well. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Go on. Fun podcast. Fred, what's good? Hey, hey, Gary Vick. How are you guys doing? We're doing well. What's cooking? That's good, man. It's good. You know, first off, thank you for having me on here. And uh, Vic, you know, congratulations on your recent success as well. Thank Definitely. you. Definitely. That's, that's awesome. Good story to hear there. Um, my question would be to kind of both you guys. Um, you know, I'm 29 years old. I still feel like I'm young. You know, I, I, I feel like I'm, I can still take a lot of risk in my life when it comes you to can. a lot of investments right now. So, I love it. I love you know, it. How, how do you determine, you know, when to take risk versus, versus reward? Understood. Victor, how do you think about that question? I know he's asking the confines of investing. Maybe you haven't even started that process, but there might be a different angle you'll take on that question. You know, and 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 Fred, when you say you know risk versus reward, how are, go even more literal on that because I think it'll help people. Yeah, to kind of be more literal, I mean, you know, I, I work forty hours a week. You know, any extra money I do, I, I try to invest. You know, hoping that it's gonna you know turn into more money in the future. Obviously. Do you, have um, a good, wanna... do you have a good sense that your biggest asset is if you're only working 40 hours a week, how many hours in the week you have that you're not working? Does that run through your mind? Do you realize that's your biggest asset? Never really thought of it that way, Gary. I'm, that, I'm glad because, you know, in a world where there's 168 hours in a week and you're only in for 40, and even if you go another eight hours times seven, which is a nice chunk of sleep, 56, you know, at 96, you know, hours between sleep and work you you know you're still looking at 72 hours in a week and i think you know when i'm when i hear you invest you know your resource of time is far greater than your resource of that little extra money you have from an investing standpoint and so i'm really excited how quickly and kind of concise you said i never thought of that that's your bigger asset to make money to win to be happy to be fulfilled, right? Like you probably saw it because a lot of people saw it today. I was garage selling my ass off. It was my time that I was willing to put into waking up at six in the morning today that led me to finding those 1000 Magna Japanese comic book books. It was my $270. That's a $7,000 profit. We're breaking it down right now. Like there's 7,000 in profit. That's yes. a lot better than two hundred seventy dollar invest. You, there's no, there's very few two hundred seventy dollar investments you'll make that get you seven thousand in return, right? But the asset, I, if I was still twenty two, what I would have done is I would have listed every one of those and put them on eBay, and I wouldn't have done them in bulk because I wouldn't want to maximize my dollars, and I would have taken the next two months, probably another two hundred hours. 50 hours, 30 hours, I don't know what the math would be there, to sell that, it was my hours, not my $270 against what I bought today. And if everybody doesn't know what I'm talking about, it's all over my social today for everyone who's live. If you're listening on the podcast, it, I, you know, there's a trash talk episode coming about this. You know, um, there you go, right? So notice what happened. It's so weird that you asked that question. Literally today, literally seven, you know, 12 hours ago, I did what I want you to do, which is my $270 to buy those, you know, thousand books that I found today were far less the asset that I deployed than my time. Your biggest advantage right now is you can learn, you can network, you can do shit. Oh yeah, man. That's people and people are like Gary, my time is valuable. I'm like the only people that tell me their time is valuable is people who don't have valuable time. <laughs> Victor, your thoughts? I feel like what you said beats <laughs> whatever I gotta say. I don't have anything concrete. I love you, brother. All right, let's move on to the next one. Fred, thank you. Thank time, you, Gary. time, education, networking. What's in your brain and whose soul you connect with. Awesome. Meet people, right? You're part of this Discord community. Try to meet people. Try to do physical, like, you know, get togethers, like relationships and education. 
right? Everybody's think people don't realize how much I value education. I don't like the way the school system sells it, but education's all I know. I got a, 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 a one little drop of blood with NFTs in November, December, and I was like a shark from 400 miles away and fucking did hundreds of hours of research before I said a fucking thing. So people that were ahead of me, like not only nine months ahead of me, like Victor here, when he saw somebody that he knew and admired, Gary Vee, came in and came in proper, he's like, my guy, instead mm-hmm. of, instead, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm speaking a little bit for you, but I assume that when you saw me come and I'm actually talking knowledgeable, unlike what we saw from other people from the left side, that made you feel good. That made you, that reaffirmed you, your belief in me, that built my reputation to you. Definitely. Fred, learn shit and meet people. It's 40 hours a week means you fucking, at 29, you're fucking loaded with the greatest resource in the world, time. Awesome, Gary. Thank you. I I was going to run with that for sure. I love it. Let's keep it moving. Hey, guys. How are we doing? Benny, what's good? I'm cool, man. I got some questions for you. I've I've been making music and content for six years. I'm actually just in the middle of a skit right now. I had to come in, do this, but then back to work. Um... I love doing it. I'm so happy. This is what I want to pursue in life. But my question is, even after six years of cooking up, and I know both of you can answer this, what do you do after you have like that best song or that best content or best piece of art? And then you wake up the next day and you're like, I got nothing. Like you, you feel like that was, how are you going to beat that? How do you work with that? Victor, I'd love to hear your point of view on that. I think... You just keep trying and trying <laughs> and keep going and going and <laughs> yeah. don't sleep and then keep going and keep going, then get sleep and then let all that process and just keep doing your best. You can't really force anything, but to an extent, you can't just like sit around and wait for it to come. You got to make sure it happens and um, make sure people hear it. That's all. Yeah, seriously. Benny, I, I love Benny, that. Benny, for me, I've never ever thought that I put out my best thing. Ooh. It's never run through my mind. And I would argue that if you've had that feeling, the place I would ask you to go is that actually insecurity talking and you're Mm. gassing yourself up. Because I feel like probably deep, 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 you, you know, it's unlikely that you feel that you're there yet. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't 100%. know you, so maybe you have, but like, I feel like if you're actually living that life where you believe you just made the best shit ever, you'll never top it, I think that there's something there there. I, that, is, that has never crossed my mind. Yeah, so. I've, go ahead. I'd uh, like to throw in please, that I think I have made art that I think is the best, okay? <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is the best piece of art I ever made. But use that as motivation where it's like, how can I make something better? Yeah, yeah. I don't think you should be like, nothing I make is good. Yeah. I think you should look at it and be like, that was fire. How can I make something more fire? And then be the artist scientist that you are and keep experimenting with that until you make that thing that you feel is right in your heart. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with that because I'll, I'll, like, I'll create an album and each thing that I do that's after is the best thing I've ever created. So everything that I'm doing since I'm learning from my mistakes is the best thing I've ever done. You know, My- you know, go ahead, I'm sorry, Ben. No, you're good, go ahead. You know, it's funny where you guys were talking, where I go, I just realized something. For me, it's grounded in humility. Mm. I don't think I get to decide. Mm. I don't even have an opinion of the shit I make. Oof. The market gets to decide. Yeah. Me saying it's the best or the worst is insular and delusional. You know, so for me, I haven't had, you know, anything where all 8 billion people said that's the greatest talk, (laughs) that's the greatest clip of all time. And until that happens, I don't think I can even have the audacity to begin to think it's the best that I could ever do. But I have the audacity to think that I can make something that all 8 billion on earth say that's it. Mm. Thank you. That. That's that's amazing, man. So it's it's always been just keep going. I've always known just keep going because I love what I do. So I'm never gonna stop. But sometimes I'll wake up and the idea that I that I'm waiting for doesn't come to me. And so ferocious, Victor, that, you answered that, that in the beginning, which was great. And 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 many on that on that point, that's just a patience game. Yeah, 
You know, when I hear you deliver that sentence, I'm like, mm-mm. That's why Patient Panda is my fucking guy. Yeah. Mm. Right? That's why I love Patient Panda. I love Patient Panda. And by the way, I also love Patient Panda because I like everybody paying attention to Patient Panda. And then I'm going to hit him with Patient Pig on the back end and stun everybody. And it was Patient Pig the whole time. Like, (laughs) that's who I am. That's how I love to play. But like, you know, Betty, when you deliver that sentence, I'm like, impatience. Yeah. And that branches right into, okay, that's why it's great to have so many different aspects, just like Patient Pig and Patient Panda. All right, this isn't working right now. Let me go work on something else that I love to do. And then you come back and you're inspired. Or, or it leads to why do you want the affirmation from the outside? Mm. And it, it's not even the affirmation from the outside. It's like, I just want to do, so, I just want what's next. And my brain's like, ah, it's not but, coming. But, 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 you know, that's fair. That's ambition. But when you balance ambition with content, mm. it gets real good. Okay. Like I'm hungry as fuck. You want to talk about a hungry hammerhead? I'm so <laughs> hungry right now. It would blow people's. Fi- if if we were like all cut and like our chemicals were like written into words, people like this motherfucker. Because I know how people view me now successfully. They're like, damn, he's fucking hungry. Fuck. What it would also say later in that sentence is, damn, he, if nothing good happens to his career ever again. He's smiling. How the fuck did he equally balance this level of hunger with this level of being content? Because you just love what you're doing so much that it's like, I'm going to keep doing it. Whatever I got to do to keep doing this, I'm going to keep doing this. And I'm still hungry. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And it that. gets real quiet. Because mm. you're, you're, it's just like I'm playing in, by myself. In dog. I'm just pl- playing with in my own world. Mm. Right? Like, so anyway, there's break that down. Hopefully that brings people some value. Yeah, Let's keep it going. You, so much. you got you. Last one. Hello, hello. Aiden. Hello. What's up, guys? Hey, How are I'm, you? I'm super well. I'm very happy and uh, grateful to be here. Uh, I've been following you for a long time. Uh, I just want to say real quick, it's super funny that you brought up uh, Patient Pig because I'm the the hollow. Owner. Okay. No. So it's pretty, pretty no, legit. Aiden. It's like destiny. Aiden. Aiden. <laughs> Brother, that is. That's I know what you're up to, my friend. I know what you're Bro, up to. Bro, you've got a very good read of me. I'm very impressed. I and bought the, it as soon as it launched. Aiden, when, when, when the project launched, did you realize that hollows were going to be the best spectacular or no? I had a gut feeling it would only because of. Uh, card collecting and that element. You thought Hollow was gonna outshine. Right. Good for you, man. I cannot believe you have that. I would argue that Hollow, Graham, Patient Pig is (laughs) big. Good shit, brother. (laughs) What question you got? It's a big one. Yeah, I am uh, very happy that Vic Vic stuck around for this uh, because the question I was excited to ask you, but uh, I'm really excited to ask Vic for now. Um, so I'm a very strong believer that adversity is the unlock to really becoming your best, right? Reaching your best potential. Uh, as you can see, you know, I'm like physically disabled. I've faced humongous adversity in my life. And it's allowed me to reach uh, goals that I never thought possible. So my question is, what role do you feel adversity has played in your mental framework development? as well as your success? I love that. Victor, please go first. That's a beautiful question. Um, I think now I don't get shy talking to anyone because I'm like, well, when I was little, I was screamed at all day by my family and they didn't accept me as my person and my identity. And at this point, I'm like, shoot, if I grew up and had to deal with all this from my own family, I don't care what right. anyone has to say to me. I'm going to just live and be me because I'm so tired of growing up and having to hide how I felt in my heart. So that's definitely, yeah, adversity has made me who I am, honestly. Do you think Do you think your art would be as great as it is without that adversity? Um, honestly, no, because I started making art as an escape from the adversity. So Truth. art, it's, it's crazy how that all happens in life. Yeah, and you know, listening to Foosh's story and Aiden obviously getting a sense, and again, if you're listening on the podcast, Aiden went on screen and Aiden, what, what, is, your, what is your situation? I have a neuromuscular disease called spinal muscular atrophy, 
And essentially, your your muscles just die over time. Yeah. Uh, so you know, I'm fully capable, mentally and aware. Uh, I run my own marketing agency. I'm an entrepreneur. I love biz dev. That's why I follow you, of course. <laughs> um, so yeah. Yeah. So when I when I you know, it it's it's incredibly uh, clear to me, in my opinion, of the situation of the three of us, that I have the least adversity in my youth of us three. But like what's probably going through both of your minds, adversity is a very personal journey. I agree. And, you know, I always, I have a lot of people, you know, I have a lot of people that I try to get out of the reverse of what all three of us emerged from our adversities. You know, we had, you know, I think all three of us, there's two, really two ways to, you know, respond to it. And I think they're both pretty extreme. It's, it's a level of, feeling like a victim and just being really sad about it. And there's a level of it being fuel. And, you know, for me, I, it's an incredible driver. It's just an incredible driver. Um, you know, growing up my whole life and basically every adult around me besides my mom telling me that I wasn't winning because I was so bad at school um, and not really having any place of, of, you know, that affirmation from like what you were supposed to do. Uh, you know, I think it's been really fun for me to share my report card occasionally because I think when people hear that I say I'm a bad student, they see my level of success and they think I'm saying C's. And like, you know, like, my, you know, when you're a kid, when you're 14 and a grown up teacher is telling you you're going to be a loser when you grow up, right. like it, it, it lands meaning like it, their words carry a lot more weight, but it never really penetrated me and it kept building and building and building. Um, and, and for me, I, you know, you've heard this from me because you follow me, like adversity is the, f the foundation of success. I really believe sure. that for anybody who's had success. I really believe that, you know, I think it's, it's really hard to be hungry when you're fed. I think adversity, I, I actually believe Aiden that so much of what, our society struggles with is the last 30, 40 years in modern American society, we've tried to eliminate adversity from our children. It, you know, obviously 100%. not everybody, you know, can't say that in front of Victor who's has a different family experience, but a lot of many millions of well-intending parents have gotten very high on things like eighth place trophies or going to school and fighting for their kids and really, in my opinion, creating a culture that has created, you know, zoo animals, right? You know, just not <laughs> able to, I say that from the standpoint of not being able to play in the wild, right? There's a lot of people that hit 22 and, you know, want their parents to continue to be their financial and emotional stability and it gets hard and resentment starts kicking in. And so I just, uh, I feel like adversity is such a gift. I think accountability is such a gift. I agree. You know? I, uh, I have really big ad ad ambitions built around uh, ad adversity with my future. Uh, I wanna do a lot of things like public speaking and um, helping others and you know being a, a figure. But before I do that, I told myself I would build a successful company before going in that direction because I don't want people to just look at me and say, oh, this guy's in a wheelchair, he's inspirational. I want them to see what I've built I think it's, as I think the it's, point. It, I think it's a massive play. I think, I think all of us, and when I say all of us, the market would have absolutely accepted you as <laughs> a motivation as having such a severe outcome. I don't know, what, what's the math around your conditioning? Do you know? Um, it, it varies. I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm pretty healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, I have like no, no, I can breathe fine. No organ issues. I mean, just people who live in their 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, there's actually treatments for my disease coming out. That yeah. is not really a cure, but more of a preventative thing. It's awesome. Uh, I, have, I have very macro goals, brother. Like that's 10, 20 years down the road. Um, and I have a, a, a real big gut feeling it. that me and you will do stuff in that I, realm. I, you know what? You're winning me over by the second. You said something, <laughs> you, that, this last thing that you just said was massive to me. What I was gonna say before I kind of sidetracked myself is the world 
just just you being this mindset against your reality would have landed with all of us. The fact that you right. took it to a totally different place and said, fuck that, I'm gonna <laughs> execute. And you know, it's why I, you know, this is where, you know, I probably connect with you so much and you with me. I, I love being motivational, but I've run a company every day of my life since operator. I was 22. I'm an operator. I'm yeah. a business builder. Same. You know, you know, like I, I, when people are like, he's a motivational speaker. I'm like running a 1500 person, $300 million <laughs> revenue business that I built from fucking scratch after I built a huge business for my dad while I did this, while I did Resi, right. while I did Empathy Wines, while I did V Friends, while I wrote five New York Times bestselling books, while, 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 while. And so, you know, and what's great about that is still 50% of the people ask, like, what does Gary V do? They just think I'm on TikTok and Instagram, <laughs> you know? And so like, you know, that, uh, I'm, I admire that tremendously from you and I'm looking forward to building our relationship, my man. Love it, appreciate it. Cheers to you. Wait, last You're thing, awesome. do you ever oh, plan yes, to build do you ever plan to build a, a V friend around adversity? You know, it's you funny. Think about it now. <laughs> a, I have. I, you know, it's funny. I have such a big passion towards adversity that I, you know, my doodling. It, you know, I'm a, I'm a very in, inspired by ferocious. Like my doodling Same. is not not confined just to my V friends. It'll be interesting to see where I go with my stuff over time, but adversity is a very big theme for me. And yes, I definitely have some thoughts. All right, be thinking of me when you do it. <laughs> I will, Aiden, we'll talk soon, later, cheers. Later, my friend, later, right. um, Victor, final thoughts on a great podcast. Let's make sure everybody's aware of what you got going on uh, and anything else you want them to know and then parting shots. First of all, I'm just really inspired by what Aiden said. I'm like, oh my God, that was so cool. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, but currently I'm in the middle of a Christie's auction. I just had a nifty gateway launch like 30 minutes ago and it went amazing. And honestly, I'm just thankful to be here and to talk to you, Gary, again. You've been a huge inspiration and I'm feeling very grateful for everyone watching right now and listening. Yeah. I love you, buddy. Love Everybody, you. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope everyone is super well. Uh, and we'll see you soon. Uh, one last time, Victor Ferocious, thank you so much for your contributions. I think this is one of the best podcasts I've ever done between our five guests, Aiden, and especially you. I think I was in the right mindset. I just felt like it's a great show. Beautiful. Uh, thank you. Cheers. Cheers.